Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast. I had a scripture that just keeps coming back to me and I'm just going to go ahead and turn to it. It's a familiar one in Philippians chapter 3. And it just seems like, you know, every time I try to put it down, there's thoughts that just kind of come without my trying to conjure them up. And nothing we haven't heard, but I feel like we're, many of us, in a place where we need the Lord to remind us and encourage us of things we know and uh, just help us to push forward in the journey, because it is a journey, isn't it? There's no magic formula by which we can suddenly get propelled to this perfection or whatever the goal is that the Lord has for us. But I believe the Lord wants to help us with the stumbling points in our journey and encourage us to go along. And, and he certainly does this through the testimony of Paul himself, who had come out of a religious system that taught him that the way to be rightly related to God was to, uh, first of all, be a Jew and, and participate in all of their rituals and all of their uh, you know, the identification through circumcision, all these things and the laws that they had to keep, that was the way anybody came to God. And if a Gentile particularly were to come to God, they would first become a Jew and then, you know, become a participant in all of that. And uh, somehow over the centuries that had involved, evolved into a religion that was very, very far from what God had in mind, what, what his intention was. To their minds, they could be righteous in God's eyes by a lot of external things that they did. You know, there's a danger of that today. That we forget that what God is wanting is, is an authentic Christ-likeness that goes to the very bone or goes to the heart, however you want to put it. And so, uh, you know, by the time Jesus came on the scene, you, you had many times when he would look at people who were very zealous religious practitioners and he'd look them in the eye and say, you're exactly like a, like a tomb. You know, men polish them up and make them look real pretty, but what's inside? And, uh, you know, you, you have the imagery also of a cup that, that's meant to hold clear water or wine or whatever they were drinking. And uh, said, you know, you're just exactly like one that they really polish on the outside and make it look like it's fit for a king. But you look inside and you think of all the most disgusting stuff you can think of, and that's what's on the inside. You can imagine saying, God, here's my righteousness. Don't you want a nice drink out of my, right, out of my righteous glass? And the Lord's looking inside and he's seeing what's really there. And that's the, that's the real picture. And, uh, you know, for Paul, it would, had to be a major shock for someone that was as zealous, I mean, sincerely zealous. It wasn't that he was a phony baloney. He, this was one guy who really wanted God. And I believe God saw the sincerity of his heart and that he was just on the wrong track. He didn't understand. And uh, you know what it took for Paul is the same thing that it takes for us. I don't care if you grow up here. It takes the same personal encounter with God. If you and I are ever to, to awaken to exactly what we, what we were singing about, that what the choir was singing about, to where we realize the truth about our condition and our need, and we come to a place where we understand that being right with God is not a matter of keeping laws and rituals. It's a matter of just coming to Him as we are and, and coming to a perfect, complete provision through Jesus Christ. What an awesome thing it is. And so, uh, and of course, for Paul, what a revelation it was. You think about all the parts that he had to go through to learn this. He had to live out Romans 7, where he was having to compare his old way of serving God through, through zealously keeping laws, on, on the other hand, and coming to Christ as a hopeless sinner and partaking of his life and the grace of God. Two different ways to go at it. And he really thought that he could do it himself and he had to find out the hard way that he couldn't. Anybody ever found that out? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so he came to a place where it was just throwing up his hands. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? And that's when the Lord made real the heart of the gospel. 
that we can come to him just as we are. What a revelation. And just hand over our guilt, our sins, our past, our everything is wrong, and realize that God has already taken care of that on the cross. That he gives us his gift of forgiveness and righteousness and life, a righteousness you and I could never attain to. He gives it to us as a gift. And he doesn't leave us there. He comes in to live, doesn't he? What an amazing revelation that had to be for Paul. And he's expressing the outworking of that because, you know, as we've said many times, coming to Christ and experiencing genuine forgiveness, the cleansing for everything that has ever happened. I mean, the guilt is gone when we really apprehend what he's done for us and just give it to him and give him our hearts and our lives. It's gone. Oh, praise God, we don't have to carry that burden anymore because he carried it on his shoulders to that cross. And he, bought, he, he got what you and I deserved. But oh, what a, what a thing it is. But just coming to him now in that, and experiencing the gift of righteousness and the forgiveness of sins is only the beginning. Now you see, you go through Paul's writings and you realize what God is after here. You know, you've got a, you almost got a picture in a lot of what, what is called Christianity, nominal Christianity, and I'm aware there's a, there's a remnant among them. But in many places, it's almost like you get saved, like that's just an event, and then you practice a religious moral lifestyle where you participate in church activities and you basically live you don't go too far outside the lines as far as living a decent moral life. And then you die and you go to heaven one day. But I'll tell you what, there is, there is a calling that God gives to everyone that he does call. It goes way beyond that. And that's what Paul expresses in this passage. There is a, there is a goal that God has in mind. And it's not just that I you know, just muddle along with all my faults and failings and just sort of, well, that's me and you know, it's all by grace, it's done away with and I just sort of muddle through. There is a goal to be achieved. There is something that God is looking for. There's changes that are going to be made in you and me. We didn't really sing the song this morning. There's going to be changes made. And so Paul saw his whole life stretching out before him as like a, a race, going for a goal. There's a goal out there that God has set before me but not only has he said it before me, he has given me the means by which I can attain that goal. And so my life every day is about that journey. Amen. I'm not satisfied where I'm, well, I'm jumping way ahead of myself. But anyway, this is the, the heart of what he's talking about in this passage. And so you can understand with Paul's experience in the, in the, the religion of the Pharisees and now the, the amazing revelation of Christ. What he's talking about in, uh, in verse 2 of that passage is watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. And what he's talking about were religious teachers who were going around and, and supposedly embracing and preaching the gospel. But what they were preaching among the Gentiles was you've got to be circumcised, you've got to become a practicing Jew. That's a step towards you know, in order to have Christ, you've got to become a, a Jew, basically, and embrace all this outward stuff. And, you know, I never really paid attention to it, but, but Paul refers to them as people who do evil. This was not some little neutral thing. This was not some little religious difference of opinion. This was, these were agents of Satan, maybe unwittingly in some cases. I don't know. God knows. But the thing is, they were agents of Satan to turn people aside from the simplicity of bringing it, everything to Jesus' feet, laying it at his feet, and embracing the, the perfect hope of righteousness. I have no hope looking at myself. Neither do you. Looking at yourself. Or looking at me either. But praise God. So Paul is really, he's really concerned because this was a problem as the church as the gospel went out to the Gentile world, there were those who come right in behind it trying to say, hey, it's a, you've got to become a Jew, basically. And Paul says, that's nuts. These are people who do evil. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. What does that sum it up? Praise God. 
We're the ones. All of that was a picture. It was real. It was for the time. But God was, was pointing to a day when something real was going to come. And that was only a picture of it. We, we can leave that behind because it doesn't matter now whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. You're part of the people of God. If God has done that work of revelation in your heart and he has brought you to Christ and you have committed your life unto him, he's come in and made you a new person. That's what makes, that's what makes you a part of the people of God, not any of this external stuff. That's it. So we worship, we worship by the Spirit of God. Do you see where the energy for that comes from? You pick up on that little phrase? We worship, but how do we do that? See, there was a kind of worship that Paul had engaged in before this where he was saying, yes, God, you're worthy to be served, and I'm going to give it all I've got. But he wasn't doing it. He was doing it with his energy, his resources. That's not what God's looking for. He is looking for people who would just come to him in such dependence that even when we come together to worship God or when we live our lives is in a way that just glorifies him, we do that by the energy that he gives us. There's a sense of, of not only dependence but expectation because that's his promise. It's his gift to us. And he longs for us to experience the life that he's given to us. And so even in worship, we worship by the Spirit of God. What are such rich, rich things? And if we could just wrap our, if I could wrap my mind around it, it would make a difference, wouldn't it? Who glory in Christ Jesus. It kind of reminds you of uh, what he was writing in the, in the book of Galatians. Because he was dealing with the same issue in much greater detail. Where he's talking about those people who feel like they've got to keep the law in order to be accepted by God. And he says, no, it's not that way. We glory in Christ Jesus and the cross. That's all of our, that's all of our glory. Because if you do something... And then you bring that and God, you say, God, you're going to accept, I expect you to accept me because of what I did. You're glorying in you and what you did. Amen. I have one place where I can glory, and that's in him. Amen. He is lifted up and exalted, and his name is the one that should give every one of us hope because it means Savior. Amen. It means God has provided a Redeemer that is the answer to every issue in every one of our lives. And I just, I don't know, I sense his heart this morning wanting us to know that in a fresh way. Because there's, there's battles going on in many lives. But I'll tell you, there's, a, there's one place to which we have the right to look because of God's provision and God's promise, and that's Jesus Christ. He is not just a doctrine to believe. He is a real living person who dwells in the midst of his people to deliver. Praise his name. We glory in Christ Jesus. That's where we need to be. That's what we need to be uh, excited about and boasting about. We have nothing to boast about in ourselves, but we have everything to boast about Him. And who do what? Put no confidence in the flesh. No confidence. That means in what I what I was born with, the resources I was born with. Man, I have no confidence that that can add to this or. But you know, that's liberating if we ever come to the realization that that's not where it's at. Because how easy is it for a person who's just sort of weak, and don't we all feel that way sometimes in certain areas, to look at somebody else and say, well, it's not fair. They're strong and I'm weak. What God can't expect anything. Well, if they're truly strong in a sense that they are relying upon their own strength, you probably have the inside track because you already know you can't do it. And you will more readily come to the feet of a Savior and say, oh, Lord, I just lay my, I give myself to you. Think about when Jesus was ministering and he would go out and he'd talk to the religious people who thought they had the inside track. They were up here. They looked down at all these poor sinners. And what did Jesus say? The harlots and the publicans, the sinners, they're going to go into the kingdom before you. Why? Because they know they need a Savior. Oh, what an advantage it is when, we, when God can bring us to that place where we have no confidence in the flesh. It doesn't mean we have no confidence. You know, one of the tripping points for many of us is we get to a certain point and our confidence sags. That we, we really can make this and we can go forward. And, but think about this. I had this thought. If our confidence is sagging, what's it in? Yeah. I mean, it's like, has Jesus slipped up today? Has he gone to sleep today? Has he had a cold and he's not doing so good? 
No, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If our, if our confidence is in him and the salvation that God has freely provided for us through him, we have no reason for any lack of confidence because it's not in us. Praise God. I believe there's many of us who, who, who come to that place sometimes where we're discouraged and we're, but what are we looking at when we are? We're not got, we haven't got our eyes upon where they need to be. He is the source of everything. And so Paul, of course, then enumerates uh, his own natural qualifications because God made him the poster child of somebody who, if you could be righteous by what you did, this is the guy. So Paul, Paul is basically saying, here's, here's my qualifications, and I, as far as I'm concerned, I consider this all a bunch of junk, a bunch of garbage. I'm going to throw it in the trash can because it is worthless. Well, guys, if that's worthless, then everything we can do, everything we can trust in ourselves is, is the same way. It's completely worthless. What a, you see the wisdom of God to call somebody like Saul and, and turn him into Paul and, and just give him such a, a depth of revelation that enabled a Jew like the Pharisee to carry the gospel to the Gentiles and get it right and not corrupt it by mix, trying to mix it in with the law. Wow. Isn't God awesome? Praise the Lord. So I'll just go through what he says. If anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, that the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. I mean, if you were to measure it by the measuring strict that the Pharisees used, he, was, he got a hundred. The only problem was they got it right on the outside, and inside their hearts were full of wickedness, and God doesn't care about appearance. I mean, he cares about appearance. You understand what I'm saying. That's not what he's, what he's after. He is after something that's authentic, that, that goes to the heart. And so I'll tell you, when he, saw, when he met Jesus and he compared the glory of Jesus and the message of the cross and realized what Jesus had, had accomplished there and how it completely fulfilled the Old Testament... Oh, man, he was ready to just chuck all this in the, in the garbage can. Do you know that's what it takes? I started to say this a while ago. It takes that personal encounter. You've got to come to a place where you come face to face with Jesus. Because he, Paul is going to talk in this passage about knowing him. You know, there's knowing and there's knowing. We, call, we, we learn facts and we call it knowing. But this is something different. This is something personal. You can get all the doctrines right. You can get all the rituals right. You can get all the how you do church, depending on which tradition you're part of. You can get all of that right and miss the whole thing that matters. Because it's got to be a time when God comes to your heart and reveals his son. And then you know something in here. That just bypass your will, it bypasses your mind, it bypasses everything, and you know. You think about what it took to hold the disciples around Jesus when they were, when he was ministering. Who do men say that I am? And they listed off the opinions of people and they said, Well, who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God. I tell you, you talk, you want a rock to build on, to build something spiritual on? It's the revelation. It's, it's only it's God able to open a heart and reveal his son in such a way that we are attached to him and we see the vanity of this life, of this world, and, we, and our, our course turns 180 in his direction and he becomes Lord, he becomes the goal of life. Everything centers from that moment on, on Jesus Christ. And it's because it's a revelation to the heart. Folks, we got people that we're interested in. We need to pray that God will, will go bring them to that place of encounter. Because it's not a matter of explaining it right or explaining it better. There's a, there's a place for ministering and teaching and reasoning. That's, but I'll tell you, I don't care how well you reason. Jesus Christ himself walked among men and how many people heard him but didn't hear him, didn't know who he was. Went back and said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? 
And, but Jesus understood something. He understood this was a divine process, something only God could bring about. And he understood that those that the Father had revealed him to, they knew. And it wasn't a matter of, I don't like what he says, I don't like, you know, it was no, none of the human considerations. It wasn't how he makes me feel. Boy, we live in a nation today, in a world, a society, it's all about feelings. My God. You know, I, I, you know, that's another subject, we'll leave that alone. You could go off, off on that. But praise God. Whether we feel or not, there's a knowing. Yes. And it's not just knowing about. This is knowing in a very personal sense. Yes. And I'll tell you what. We, uh, anyway, he, so he goes through all of this. I forget what I was about to say, but it probably wasn't important. So anyway, he goes through all of this, and, and he comes to the end, and he says, But whatsoever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. And that's, I'll tell you what, it is a choice. We are either relying upon us in some fashion or we are relying on Christ. There is no way to mix that. Period. And oh, do we want to cling to that sense of, but I'm somebody, I'm worth something. You are, but not the way you think you are. I'll tell you, our value is measured by what Jesus Christ paid on the cross. And that's an infinite value. That's not a value that measures our worth in the sense that we think of it, in a prideful sense. It's what we're worth to him. Praise God. That's what's, a, well, it was expressed this morning. How amazing is that? How amazing is that? What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Now, there's something very personal about that. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Praise God. There's, there's such a simplicity to it that men stumble. They stumble through ignorance, through pride. But I pray for whoever's here, whoever may hear this, I pray that God will open your eyes, the eyes of your understanding, because that's what it has to take. There is no substitute for God making himself real in a personal way. This is not just a study about somebody who's way off somewhere. He's got to come and, and become known to you in your heart of hearts to where you'll never be the same. This has been the Midnight Cry broadcast. If you would like a DVD or a CD of today's message in its entirety, please request it by program number. DVDs are $10 and CDs are $5. And for those who request it, we will send you our quarterly publication, The Midnight Cry Messenger, free and postage paid. Send your request to Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box 685, Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388. We invite you to join us again next week at the same time, and may God richly bless you until then.